forever. I know. I haven't seen you in person. All right, since... we're good. Oh, All we're right, good. welcome. Uh, welcome to episode four. Are we at four? Is this episode four? All right, because we did a pilot. We did a pilot. We did? Yeah. Welcome to episode three. Uh, like I said, episode three of Live Brush. Uh, I'm Raymond Bonilla. Some people call me Ray Bonilla. Most people call me Ray Bonilla. But I'm going to start calling you Raymond Bonilla. <laughs> Very formal. I'll give you, I'll, I'll do every inch of your whole name and everyone you've ever known. Um, I, I'm Tyler Jacobson. Welcome back, everybody. Um, today we are continuing our... Wait, 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 oh, wait, 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 wait. No stream is even barely, even remotely functional without a director, producer, moderator, supreme. Too true. So we have to introduce ours. Our, our lovely Kate Welch. There she is. She's got her. We're going to, um, we're going to work on Foley. Yeah, we're going to, yeah. We should have like a, like a, like a, like a, a fireworks graphic pop up with, yeah, you know, with Kate's. With... All right. Oh, oh my God. All right. Everybody, so if you would like everybody to, out it, there. We're about to get some serious shit going here. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Tyler, why don't you, uh, what are we working on today? Um, yeah, so um, for those of you folks who tuned in last week, um, if you didn't, you can check out the VOD on the YouTubes. And on our, I think it's still on our Twitch. It's up there for like 14 days. So um, we are doing portraits of the mighty Michelle Nichols, Ahura from like I said last week, arguably, and I'm not even willing to argue on this, the greatest Star Trek film ever made. Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Right, a subjective opinion that you have. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you that, mean, I don't know about that. That is questionable. I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, everyone knows. I think I'm right. One is the, uh, one of the greats of all time. <laughs> I bet the chat's going crazy. Uh, for, for folks who watch us, unfortunately, and we'll probably remedy this down the line, Ray and I cannot see the chat. Um, but that's why we have our incredible moderator um, and producer, extraordinaire, B.K. Welch. And she is watching what you have to say and, and sending your questions to us. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, if you have any questions... Uh, let's throw them in the chat, uh, and uh, Tyler and I would be more than happy uh, to answer them. Or you could just uh, yeah. ask uh, Tyler uh, a question if you want to just ask Tyler a question. You can ask me a question if you just want to ask me a question. You can ask Kate a yeah. question if you just want to. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm fixing something. Podcaster. Okay, now Kate's microphone works. Oh, excellent! All right. Yeah, but there was one Sorry, point guys. I think last stream where you were pretty silent. It was like you were a hundred miles away. Okay. Hey, did they, so what did they miss your miss your intro? They did. They missed all my sound effects. Uh, where oh, I was no. like, oh god, whoa, yay! Nice and and so forth. Yeah, that was that was all. You guys missed that. Just imagine it. We'll I did say that I was going to find some yeah, sound just imagine it. Put a put a soundboard together. So I'm imagining it right now. It sounds pretty fucking cool. Okay, <laughs> so um, what we're doing today, like I said, is um, we're getting back into these paintings. I over the weekend or over the last week, I actually put a little uh, retouch varnish over mine, and I I kind of I was chatting with Ray the other day, thinking. Maybe we can chat a little bit about varnish because that's a scary place for people who are trying to work in oils or, I mean, even varnish acrylics, I guess. But um, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. But um, so varnish is, is funny and it's taken me a while to kind of get the hang of varnish over the years. Um, but specifically what I did with this is, is I put um, retouch varnish. Let me see if I can find my bottle of it. 
This is the retouch varnish that Winsor Newton makes. Everybody, it's like a Winsor Newton ad when we do this show. Yeah, we should like seriously think about sponsorship with Winsor Newton. Yeah, I mean, we use nothing but their stuff. Yeah, and it's really great. I like it. There's other brands, of course, that are also amazing, but um, creature habit, you know. But not as amazing yeah, as Windsor Newton. Newton. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, no, we don't have a deal with them. So we can't even <laughs> we, have a, we, we can't even cha-ching it. <laughs> um, so what, is, what this retouch varnish is, is um, you can put a little thin coat over your painting. I make it really thin. Just kind of scrub it in there really lightly, but not too much scrubbing because it has a solvent in it. It'll, it'll wake up your paint. Um, so I just put a super thin layer on it, and it, it acts kind of like oiling out. It makes all the darks really dark and um, a nice even finish uh, that's glossy. Um, so, and then I've oiled out on top of that, but um, I put the retouch varnish on there just to seal it all in. And you can, the cool thing about retouch varnish is you can paint back over it. Um, whereas like a final varnish or something like um, Gamvar, you can't uh, paint back over those. Um, so anyways, I'm using this just to get back in. I was, I was trying it as an intermediary step and it's, it's good. I'm happy with it. Yeah, it's good stuff. It stinks like, uh, basically the, uh, Satan's living room. Uh, and it's, it's rough. Very it's few minutes, few, <laughs> few heavy, but, uh, so be careful with that. Try and do it in a well-ventilated area. I, uh, just, yeah, uh, oiled out, uh, like, uh, we talked about in episode one. Um, I oiled out with uh, Windsor Newton painting medium. Uh, and so I'm applying just a small uh, bit of medium on it um, because I'm going to do some. Uh, I, I, oh, this is a, a, for those of you that missed last week, you should go see it. This is an acrylic underpainting that I did in essentially burn on burn white with a touch of black. Uh, and uh, I'm going to paint oils on top of it. And I'm going to start off by actually doing a little bit of glazing. Um, All right. Well, Tyler, what's Tyler glazing? didn't even know I was doing it. Uh, glazing what? essentially is a, uh, a, a, a application of uh, paint that's meant to sit almost as a veil on top, almost like a transparent veil on top of your underpainting. And what it'll do is it'll alter, if you do it right, it'll alter the color um, of your underpainting uh, so that it matches the final color of what you're doing. Uh, you could also use glazing as a corrective measure to darken things or enhance things like pump a color of the saturation of the color. Uh, so what I've done is essentially applied medium and then uh, I mixed up a, uh, using my trusty uh, palette knife um, right here. Uh, I've mixed up like a red that's the same value as my red in the uh, on a, or a sort of uh, a uniform here. And I'm gonna just test it here. That, looks okay uh but uh what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna apply it um opaquely uh, and roof, roof, roof. the dogs are here to join i know you might so you, you just... might be thinking i i know there's a lot of uh uh it's a controversial thing so some yeah, people apply it he hates what you're talking about is all <laughs> i'm saying <laughs> some people apply it uh transparently i like to uh actually uh and this is something that I learned kind of, I picked up after art school, uh, is apply it opaquely uh, as much as uh, possible over my entire area, just like this. Really kind of like not very um, organized, I would say. Uh, yeah, dude, I don't know what, this is dangerous. What the hell are you doing here? <laughs> uh, and then what I'm gonna do is uh, I will be then taking like a paper towel and you can see what that I have right in my hand. And then I'm just going to remove uh, as much of the color as I uh, want to, uh, or I want uh, the, I'm going to remove any of the color. I don't want to be there. So I'm going to like take it out in like the shadows right here. Uh, you know, I'll do the whole jacket. Here. I'm just following. Yeah, F it. Just do the whole thing. Yeah. I, you know what? I am going to do the whole thing. Thank you, Tyler. I'm glad I could encourage you to be bold. Yeah, it's as you if, Ty, if Tyler's encouraging me in something, it's usually a bad thing. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna you're gonna see it actually in the uh, 
in the flesh color here. And I'm going to see if I can nail this flesh color. I'm just trying to match okay, okay, the value. Though. So while so I do you, that, what are you? What colors are you using though, right? Oh, I'm using. Uh, I'm trying to use basically the uh, the general color and temperature of uh, the flesh. Um, and I'm uh, using, I, I like to look like right around here as the shadow is going into, uh, the cheek is going into the shadow. So it's called an area called the middle tone. That's where you get like yeah. the, the, the most sort of uh, general color. Uh, and, uh, and I'm just gonna do a little bit of testing here. Um, and this might take a little bit of time, but it's, it's worth it. Uh, and I'm using basically uh, cadmium yellow light, cadmium red light, Blizzard crimson, ultramarine blue, and, and like a cerulean blue, um, which that's a lot imagine. of colors, man. Yeah, why, why would you, you don't use really, so many colors? You don't, you don't really need all that colors. You you could just actually use uh, yellow ochre, cad red light, and white and black to get any flesh color, really. Uh, but I this is what I have left over. Uh, on this is palette. kind of a a good place to maybe. Um, so we can chat about palettes because you know we both kind of received a particular palette from Bill Mon when we were in totally. school. Totally. Um, I don't really use that palette anymore. Um, I still like it and I think it's super effective, but I've kind of gone a very different route. I, I probably by design, or not by design, but by um, necessity. Well, that's better known as a it. trader. Yeah, I mean, you know. I found a better way. No, I, I wouldn't say it's a better way, actually. It's just more convenient for the way I'm trying to work when it comes to like painting magic cards, um, which have a lot of magical effects. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's, um, there's certain like chromas or s levels of saturation, I guess, that I cannot achieve with um, older palettes I was using. So, um, what I'm using now is I use, um, I have titanium white, um, I have French, or maybe I can show you guys with my old palette knife. So this is titanium white, titanium white. Um, then I use French ultramarine, which is like a blue. Um, I use burnt umber which if you're trying to find this on the color wheel, it's like a brownish orange, very dark. Um, I use a lizard and crimson, this little guy, wonderful color, we talked about it last stream. Um, and then I use cad yellow, uh, light. Um, and that would be kind of what I get to get all my base colors out of, with just those. So it's fairly limited, but um, what I've found painting a lot of magic cards is there's a lot of magical effects and those, none of those colors can reach a level of saturation for magical effects of any sort of glowing or incredibly high um, saturation colors. So I have another little set of colors that are essentially what you would find in a printer right? Um, your, your CMYK, your cyan, your magenta, and your yellow, and your black. Um, so I don't really use the black, but I use, I'm going to put them up here in front of the camera. I use a, a cobalt turquoise, which is essentially your cyan, pretty close. Not perfect, but pretty close. Um, and then this really funny color called quinacridone magenta. That's a great um, color. It's an amazing, it's, it's a lot like alizarin crimson, but it's it's I'd say it's more towards purple and like I'd almost say higher chroma. Would would you say? Oh yeah. You agree? yeah, yeah. I got it on my palette now too. I, just, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, and then and then I use this cad lemon. Um, so these guys together make incredibly vibrant colors, um, and they work super well for magical effects if you're doing fantasy illustration. Um, anything that's glowing, th this ends up being what you what I gravitate towards in creating those effects. Um, this one's by Gamlin, but uh, Windsor Newton also makes a quinacridone magenta. They make a bunch of quinacridones, I think. Um, so yeah, that, that's a little um, 
yeah, I have a, I have another Gamblin Quinacridone Violet, which is really nice as well. So that's like kind of where we sit in crazy colors. Well, if, and if uh, you would like to, uh, you know, uh, see us, if Windsor Newton or Gamblin would like to have us review all of their Quinacridones, <laughs> uh, we are open for sponsorship. Yeah, actually, that, that, um, that's, let me find these so you can see where where I went to try and get the right magical blue. Um, I, I went to the store and I bought all these. There's all of them. I'll put them up front of the camera. This is Cobalt Turquoise Pure um, by Utrecht. This is, um, what's this one? Uh, Cobalt Turquoise Blue by Rembrandt. This is Turquoise by Gamblin, 1980. This is Cobalt Teal, which actually is the one I kind of landed on. And then there's a um, Cobalt Turquoise Light. Um, yeah, so if you, uh, you know, so if you go uh, buy all the colors that exist, you, you could find you could, the right one. Yeah, yeah. If you take out, you just take out a loan and uh, yeah, small um, small loan, and then uh, you know, I think you'd be fine. Yeah, and uh, yeah, this actually hurt a little bit because I think most of these are like series two and. They're all, it was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Hey. yeah, I expensed it. I expensed it. And they'll have them forever, you know. Um, but the, what I found is these are the two that I really like for like blue magic. And you can pump um, French ultramarine into these to give them like a really intense blue, but it's darker value. Um, but Cobalt Teal by Gamblin and um, Cobalt Turquoise Light are awesome pigments for magical blue effects. Got, I got a question. Yeah. This is from Bonks1 in the chat. When working so digitally, Bonks. Bonks, when working digitally, I have a problem getting my colors to be the same as when I use my limited palette working traditionally. Do you have any tips on how to limit the palette on the computer? Um, absolutely. Um, I digitally, uh, Ray, you probably have solutions for this too. Um, we probably both do something similar. I tend to float around in the gray a lot and build in saturation. Um, that's sort of the method I've figured out for digital is I have a, a gray finished painting, essentially under painting. And then I start building in colors using like colorized layers, um, multiply layers and overlay layers. So we're gonna talk about digital, um, Overlay adjusts value and color at the same time. Um, multiply is more about um, a glaze. It's more like a glaze, so it darkens things, but it can also adjust color. And then colorize just colorizes. It, it keeps your values pretty pretty the same. Um, it's simulating though, so it's not perfect. Um, and that's kind of, and I build in on that. Um, but, but there's other methods, like you could actually get a physical color wheel and photograph that and then gamut map it kind of like James Gurney does where you select off um, the, the main colors you want to be using and then you don't use any colors outside of that triangle. Um, what do you think on this, Ray? There's so many methods uh, that, that we yeah. can go about doing Jeez. this. Uh, yeah, I mean, I uh, basically do what, uh, my digital painting method is probably identical to what I'm using for this painting. So I do everything in gray um, to work at all my values and basically do is, is exactly what Tyler was, uh, uh, saying. Um, and what I do is I essentially do a finished painting in grays, get all my values composition drawing out of the way. So I did just like I did with this for the most part. Uh, and then I introduce uh, a, a local, uh, uh, just a layer. I just use like a, a color, um, and I block in, you know, uh, where my warms and my cools are uh, using a color uh, layer, like with a color adjustment on it or a blending mode. Uh, and then I'll even put a gradient down of like, and of warm cool. And if I need to wash that in, I'll do that. And everything's done transparently. And then what I'll do is I'll just build out uh, from there. But if I like a, a color, I'll usually create like a little extension a lot of times off to the side and I can build my palette with just like little circles of the of my colors in my palette uh, and then essentially uh just color pick that you know uh, yeah that's a great method too um like yeah. 
putting putting swatches on the side, color picking from there, even finding a painting that you like and color picking um, colors totally. out of that. Totally. Because you'll, you'll notice that like when you uh, finish off, if you do like a finish, if you get your values right, and you put a color down, it'll instantly colorize it. If you look at my, my painting right now, I did really literally nothing. I just smushed some colors together and all of a sudden you're starting to see uh, some of the uh, the colors come into play, but I this is all the gray is doing all the heavy lifting for me. Um, it's nothing, uh, uh, you know. It's not uh, not the color that's doing anything. I'm just it's I'm just matching the values. So if you got your values and uh, it's going to be it's a lot easier to do. Um, at least I find uh, because with it's hard uh, when you're digital painting straight straight into the color you kind of have to do what tyler is doing or what i did on the last painting where you just basically block in like a two values essentially with uh, a light side and a shadow side of all your forms and just color pick those and find those two general values that work just right uh, and then um then and only then when you have everything in uh then you can go and start building out from like the general middle tone to the lights and the darks. Um, you know, there's a lot of methods in there, but uh, I think the, you know, the one we described is a really nice straightforward one because it compartmentalizes um, a lot of, uh, you know, the picture making problems into stages that you can focus on, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, cause like Ray was saying, like um, if you're working from gray as you're underpainting, like I tend to, um, just like Gray mentioned with temperature, I tend to actually knock in my temperatures first before I even add color. So, you know, yeah. as, as a principle of composition, you know, value is king. And then temperature is your secondary point, you know. Um, I think we talked about this last time. I kept saying, like, color doesn't matter. Of course it matters, but that temperature is super important. And Ray does that in his paintings like crazy, the having his um, hot focus, you know, that, that hot temperature pushes forward. Um, so you can build your compositions around that too. So if I'm painting digitally, I tend to go black and white and I find the temperatures where I want the, the hot to be, which is going to be your focal point. And then, um, and then I kind of start building in colors, but it's, yeah, it's a yeah. much, it's almost an afterthought when it comes to getting the values and the temperatures, right? Totally. Yeah. And that's, that's what like, I think putting down a base color and having something to work into after you have a graze is, is, is really easy to work with. So you can just use that color picker in Photoshop or whatever you're working it with, you know, to just go up in value and then go down in value. And then if you understand sort of how um, color reacts uh, when it goes across form, uh, then it's, you know, it becomes a, uh, a lot easier to manage and that's i mean I, i'm basically that's what i'm going to do now is i'm basically going to go in and paint um my finishing layer uh, on top of this uh, stuff and so i can um and if i don't like it the great thing about it is because i'm working over a dry uh initial surface that's just completely dry i could just wipe it out and, uh, and that's great. yeah and we're both working in mediums that are that are fairly forgiving so yeah totally um you know, if this watercolor, there'd be no wiping it out, right? No, no, just that. So you got to whip out the gouache of the acrylic. And <laughs> don't tell and me. Cheap. Or just do a but, bunch um, of studies. Yeah, that was a great question. That That is yeah. like a rabbit hole question, right? Like we could get into, I don't know, man. It's such a deep dive trying to figure out color and it's, color accuracy. and It's deep, bro. It's deep. It's so deep. Get deep, no, yeah, but it is a great, great question. Well, luckily, I have another question for you. Oh, great. All right. All right. We're, back. We're back out. Laz Ray in the chat asks, what is Ray doing with the tissue? Taking excess paint or pushing the paint into the canvas? Oh, I'm taking the excess paint out. So if I don't like it, uh, I'll just erase it. And the under layer is going to show through. Uh, and so um, I'll put a color down. If I don't like it, I'll wipe it out. Like uh, like this red under here, well, I'll leave that alone. But if I didn't like a, a color, let's just say here, I don't know if you can see that. Or like, uh, let me pick a color here. So if I don't like, I put a, a color around here and I don't like that. 
uh, I could just take my my area, my little rag, and then just erase it. Or I could, if I'm Control Z, yeah, it's Control, control Z. Z. Or Control Z. Uh, or what you could do is, if you have a lighter touch, if you get good at it, you can actually tone down the color a little bit, so it just feels like it's a little bit of red. And so what I'll do, this is called veiling. Uh, it's a very common method used. Let me, uh, you know what? I'm gonna do that right now. Veil it, man. Veil that thing. Let me just uh, clean the old brush here. And I don't have like an easel that I could beat my brush against uh, like Bob Ross does, but oh, yeah. I don't Good recommend point. doing that. I don't recommend doing that. Good for your lungs and stuff. Yeah. Horrible for your lungs. No, it's don't not. There's a liability. I think that's a liability for saying anything like that. Never yeah. do that. Never, Never do what Bob Ross did. Yeah, we do what Bob Ross did. Please Probably don't recommend fatal practices to the live yeah. stream audience. Thank you. Yeah, I will not. Please. I will not. That is, like we said last stream, what Bob Ross is doing was incredibly dangerous. Please don't ever do that. We do not handle know. your oil paints with care. There we go. You see that? I don't know if you can see. Is that show up? But it's just lightly just scribbling across the color, and you notice it's not because it's. It's so thin and the underpainting is reading through. It's just adjusting it ever so slightly. So if I need it to just pop in a little bit more like red, I can veil across that. And if it gets a little bit too strong, I can just take my, um, like for instance, like right here, I can just take my rag and then just dab it until it just mixes in. And it'll mix in a little bit with the color that I laid down. And that's okay. I can I can keep it kind of free and loose. Uh, but uh, when I start to build form, I got to uh, paint it opaquely. Uh, so I'm not going to be, if I am going to start lifting out or uh, using my paper towel, it's going to be to erase stuff, get that out of the way. Which I now, would you say, to... Ray, on your on your painting, would you say that that um, gray underpainting is actually helping unify your colors because it's showing through a little bit? Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, it's it's definitely helping me. It's doing two things. It's instantly telling me when my, if my colors are light or too dark. And then because of that, uh, it's helping me unify my valleys, which is gonna help me just, allow me to just concentrate on the colors uh, uh, only uh, for, for some time, because I know that I have my values stripped down. Uh, you know, we were talking about this uh, uh, after the stream, but it really is like, it's almost like you're, it's a, it's an extra step of work because unlike uh, direct painting, which is what Tyler is doing, it requires multiple uh, layers essentially, uh, but mm -hmm. it does afford you things that direct painting doesn't. Um, like you can just work your coloring nice and slowly uh, and not have to worry uh, about things. And, and you can, you know, have the illusion if, uh, and this is something I used to do at the advice from, uh, from advice from uh, that I got from our teacher Bill Mon, was uh, you essentially, if you want to paint thick and have the same, you could like basically combine effects. So you can paint super thick and brushy and, and build up, you know, paint with just white, uh, a monochromatic underpainting, uh, just like I did, and then you could just glaze over thin thin color and you can get this luminous effect that's how like like rembrandt was able to achieve a lot of his results uh and so um you know that there's textural advantages uh to that type of stuff uh but yeah it all depends on what you want you know um mm -hmm. that's why I I think that so maybe we can we can dig into why that why that is maybe people would want to hear that like it's it's all about the hills and the valleys of the, the texture of what you're painting on, right? Um, so you know if you're glazing, you're filling in those valleys, and then if you're kind of scrubbing paint over the top, scumbling, you're you're hitting the tops of those valleys, and that's what Rembrandt was doing. He was he was layering that over and over and over again. That's why you get those beautiful deep paintings out of him. Yeah, totally, uh, and you know. Uh, and a, a lot of artists would, would uh, use this, especially to create uh, optical color mixing. Like, you know, if you have, you glaze a red over, you know, uh, an, a great underpainting, you get this sort of weird bloom effect. Like you're kind of seeing it right here. It's like a higher chroma 
and that was often used because they didn't have that many colors available to them. Uh, and so uh, combine that with the fact that like the paint tube didn't exist uh, and they had to make basically a mountain out of a, a you know, a molehill or, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. And so like uh, it allowed for all these different optical uh, effects uh, and really interesting color effects. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, but a lot of people use it, you know, use it for that same reason even today. Um, but you can combine that with other things like I'm going to go in and actually paint it directly uh, like Tyler would, um, you know, actually right now. Uh, and I can have areas that are super transparent like this. You see, like, I love this, like, ambery kind of stumbled layer that uh, was from my underpainting. So I'll leave that alone and I can mess around with the colors and, you know, uh, have different, like, have it maybe thicker here and then just go out to this nice scrub. I, I like that idea. So you don't have to cover up your underpainting uh, in its entirety as, uh, you know, either. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers. Did I answer the question? I honestly forgot what the question was. I just got off on a tangent. And I, I think we got in the weeds, but it, it's cool. It's all information, right? I don't we got know in the weeds, Tyler. We, we got to get out of here. I don't remember what the question was. I, I think remember. the question was, oh, forgot the question. I don't uh I'm pretty sure we answered. I'm not. I'm not going to help you. No, this was okay. this was oh, wow. based, this was a this was spinning off of Ray's tissue. Oh right, right, right. right. Yeah, Ray's tissue. Ray's like little tissue. tissue. It sounds, like, sounds like Ray's. We got a, we got a Ray's trademark. Ball. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sponsored by Viva. We're still looking for sponsors. This just. Uh, I, I you know I still so we were recommended Viva in school. I still use Viva all the time. Yeah. It's the so, best paper towel for oil painting. Yep. It's, Another sponsor. It, it's it's expensive. It's more expensive <laughs> than other paper towels, but it lasts like twice as long. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. All right. So I'm I guess, I mean, I guess on this, this episode, we're... I mean, we're going to finish these out, but um, what's up what, next time? What are we going to do next time? Well, I, you, think, think about that. Yeah. Hold on. I have another I, question. You guys can deal okay. with next oh, time. Okay. Okay. Let's deal with next time near, near the end of the episode. Stay focused yeah, in the present idea. moment. Tyler. You know what? I'm just, I like to look into the future. You, you leaving already? Yeah. <laughs> you, you busy, buddy? Uh, so we, we got from Epiquate, our dutiful mod in the chat has a question. Is there a benefit to paper towel over cloth or vice versa? Um, I personally found that my paper towel kind of fuzzes onto the canvas a lot more. So I tend to not use it as much um, on near the canvas. I use it to wipe off my brushes. Um, but if I'm going to wipe anything around on the canvas, like if I'm oiling out, I will use a microfiber cloth for that. One of these guys, I'll hold it up. Um, I had it up earlier, earlier on, but I just use like one of these microfiber cloths. It doesn't you shed with the microfiber. The, wow. It doesn't shed onto the um, canvas. And you can get them yeah. for very cheap in like giant bulk stuff off the internet. It's a great answer. I uh, use my paper towel on my painting. Um, yeah, I just said you shouldn't do that, right? So I just said don't do that. So to is it to Everquate? Is that the right thing? Ever, <laughs> Everquate, yeah. And the Vivas, Everquate. you guys Thanks are talking for, about for the, modding, by the, the 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 yeah. It is very very kind. Uh, he's he's volunteering his time to make sure that there's no follow bots spam in the chat. He already smashed one down last episode. Um, the Vivas you guys were mentioning are those blue shop towels, right? No, no those are no. different, but those are oh. great too. What it's am I thinking this of? Stuff. What are those? What are those blue towels? That you uh, have Terry to towels. Use? I think Terry Terry towels. Yeah, yeah, I use like I do use the blue stuff occasionally. It's um, it's like a blue paper towel that you would find in an auto shop yeah, yeah. those they're, are like, they're also, all over also our basement great. so i knew they were yeah i stopped using those because i felt like they were shedding a little bit more and so i went back to the 
I think Kate's trying to hint that oh, I if know. you are going to leave, you need to clean up the basement. In the basement. <laughs> Nick DeLuca96 <laughs> says, if we're voting on what's next, I vote for a Star Wars character, Darth Maul, more specifically. Mm. Hmm. I like that. It, it clashes a little bit with our 80s theme, but I'm, I'm willing to uh, venture out. I think we point. could we could probably come to some kind of compromise. You guys want to do 80s. Ray wants to go villain. I mean, yeah. there's a Darth Vader oh, in there. Yeah. There's a Palpatine in there. A Pal- Palpatino. Oh. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of options. Palpatine would be great. Okay, How I'm about not this? saying Darth Maul wouldn't be great, but Palpatine Nick, would be really Nick, we'll, great. Nick, we'll take suggestions as long as they uh, match what we were going to do anyway. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. If it's exactly what we were going to do, then <laughs> we'll, we'll do it. <laughs> also, we grew up in the 80s and Nick clearly didn't, so... That's just making us feel old, and uh, yeah. Ooh, Grand Moff Tarkin. How about Grand Moff Tarkin? I'd love to see you guys take Tarkin. Oh, that would be great. That, that, um, I I, I I think I've sent this. I've I've sent this to Ray a million times over the years, but um, there's a an amazing special effects artist named Jordy Shell, and he years ago, man, years ago, he did this bust of Grand Moff Tarkin. If you guys can find it on the internet. Woo! It's it's like kind of scary. So Grand Moff Tarkin is there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's eerie. It's it's sick. I, I was Do you think they had him work on that fake Tarkin? Uh God, I hope so. The, the CGI Tarkin that they had? Cuz that was pretty decent. The one in what was it? Um Rogue One. Yeah. Yeah, I think they so. did. They actually uh, re- they did a deep fake on it. Uh, and, like somebody fixed it up, and the deep fake <laughs> looked insane. You know, um, like a fan did a deep fake. Yeah, yeah. What? You could check. You could check it out. I'm it go was watch it right scary now. good. Problem with deep fakes is, of course, the resolution. But uh, man, on YouTube, whoo, man, it looked good. Yeah. It, it made it made the road one one look Sorry. really awkward, which is shocking how good it was <laughs> well i mean yeah. i, I wouldn't have to get in deep into film critique right but i yeah I, I thought they gave that Tarkin a little too much screen time it was very cool effect but it should have been like limited to one scene or something right right oh wow this deep you, fake Disney. is nuts love you. right see i say we do Tarkin. Tyler, I, okay i don't know I'd be I'm for it. Yeah, I yes, I played the beginning of the audio, and yes, the whole stream did hear it. Just a minute, just a second of it. I did go look, and now I've well, you know now what? I've fixed it in the chat. Everybody can watch it. I didn't hear it. So. Well, Disney, if you want to sponsor us, uh, we'll play more. Yeah. Hey, Disney. Jeez, you how many sponsors are you guys hoping for here? I got. I mean, I Wait, a lot, a lot. <laughs> pretty much any business who stumbles across us, I know Disney's watching right now. They're, they're always watching. <laughs> I know you're watching. <laughs> I know you're watching. So, okay. So, yeah, let's do, Um, I guess, let's call it. Let's call the ball here. Grand Moff Tarkin. Boom, done. Yes. All right. I love it. I love oh, my it. gosh. I've, I'm really excited to see y'all take on um, wrinkles. I, I'm fascinated by paintings of really wrinkly people. All right. We'll, we'll see. It. We'll take requests for, for wrinkles. You know, Tyler, you could do a wrinkles, and then I could uh, just uh, pretend the wrinkles by just, you know, painting around it. But yeah, you can do the deep fake version of him as a young man. <laughs> uh, that'd be sick. Now I'm so going to go with how far I'm gonna... Yeah, you keep talking, <laughs> Tyler. I'm going to, I got to finish this thing. I gotta yeah, say, the um, there was a, I don't know when I found this video. I must have been in high school or something. Um, but I found a video on the internet of Grand Moff. The guy plays Grand Moff Tarkin. What was his name again? Anybody? Chat? Anybody? Hang on. Tarkin actor. I always forget his name too. And he, he just, re- he passed yeah. it. Peter Cushing. Peter Cushing. Yeah. Peter, oh right. my God. Um, how, did, how did we miss that? That was I, know, I, forgot I knew that. that the whole time. Just for the yeah, moment. he knew. I knew Ray knew. <laughs> and he was holding out on me. Um, there's a video of him, and this is like 
I think it was when I was in high school or before. But he's painting miniatures, like all these little war miniatures. What? And and I at the time was super into Warhammer forty K and painting miniatures. So I was losing it. I was losing my shit. Like, holy shit. Oh my this god. This guy is into miniatures and he he's is. an actor. Hang on, I'm I'm posting this in the chat too. If you're watching this on YouTube, just Google oh. it. Is the the video of him painting minis? Well, this is just a screenshot of him painting minis. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Anyways, You're kidding me. Amazing. I thought it was pretty cool because I didn't know any of that. Wow. Well, now you know. Everyone's here to learn. Ray. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's the next question? Tyler's talking a lot. Uh, no, you need to keep talking, dude. Sorry, I, gotta, I went to the side. I got to finish this painting. Ray's hustling to get this painting done. Yeah, finish I kind of talked Ray. about this middle of the week with Ray. I was like, I don't know how much else I'm going to do on this because I, I'm, I like an unfinished piece, and I'm kind of at a point where I could leave it unfinished. I'll probably paint her earrings or something. You, so why would you not finish her hair? Uh, I'll, I'm going to do that. I'll do the hair, but I don't. I kind of like. There's something I like about leaving paintings like this, where you kind of see the artifact that it was a painting. It's, it makes um, it very. Uh, we're going to use a very technical term. It's called making the painting look arty. <laughs> so, it does it, it it reminds the person looking at it that it is a painting yeah but um old, no I'll, I'll paint the hair. is that maybe actually so maybe this is just a taste thing but it ahead, could be ahead. so tyler your style is very realistic ten, tends to be like high realism um and ray i i'm don't i don't have the art education to put real words on it but yours always strikes me as more impressionistic um in, yeah, I would in ways so, yeah. I, would that would that be accurate so is it true yeah, like do you need to add artyism to a more realistic painting so that it doesn't just look like a photograph is that a thing well, i think it depends on your taste level i mean there's plenty of artists out there that can get to a point where um they they paint their painting to like photo level and that's what they want it's all about yeah. what, what you're after and it's also about like you know the kind of work uh the kind of work you want to i guess i'm trying to find the right word for this um like who you want to do work for um if you want to do work for particular clients and from an illustration perspective then you know you want to create work that fits their type of brand essentially totally totally um so if, yeah if you want to do really hyper realistic work then you're the, the brands you're going to be working for are, um, you know, there's kind of a short list for that, those brands. Right. But if you're doing more stylized work, there's sort of a broader list. Uh, so there's a lot more companies out there doing really stylized work or using stylized work, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, my illustration work when I was doing it a lot more, I mean, was pretty much tighter, I would think, than my, um, I don't know. What do you think, Tyler? Yeah, I, I think you were um, leaning, um, I guess, if you you were less impressionistic, I think, when you were doing your yeah. illustration. So. Um, so, which you, you kind of, a lot of, in my experience with illustration, sometimes you can't really be too impressionistic. Um, yeah, yeah, they don't like the big stuff. Yeah, or the client's going to be like, well, that, you know, that's Superman and you, you painted his suit, not the blue that we're used to um because maybe you're just being impressionistic about the colors of the, of his suit um so that the sometimes you can't get away with that sometimes that's what they're looking for but a lot of the times you, you're gonna have a hard time getting away with it that's true sometimes that is what they're looking for i should say that i shouldn't say uh because i did a whiskey label uh illustration and uh right. tyler actually posed for it, uh but that was and me. They, had, that's me. They, they had wanted Look at Uncle Nearest whiskey. Oh crap! Should we say brands? I mean, yeah, uh, we said Windsor Newton. We said Disney. Uh, we said Disney. Oh yeah, we're way past the pale on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's let the legal team at uh, Livebrush Legal Team, Livebrush Legal, legal uh, at Livebrush dot show. Uh, yeah. Lazare in the chat wants to know, Ray, is there a place where people can see your illustration work? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, where you got it? It's on your website? 
No, you know, I, I know it that's off. I was I've been to Ray's website. I ain't seen no illustration. But this is a great thing to chat about. Okay, Ray, why did you take the illustrations off the site? Uh, I, you know, I think it was just because I wanted to approach galleries uh, more and felt that my I had both illustration and fine art on my site, and I thought it was a little bit too jarring. And if I wanted an illustration site, I would probably just create a separate illustration site for my illustration work. That's great. Uh, I mean, that kind of falls yeah. in with what we said, recommended about portfolios um, last week. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. Ray's, Ray's targeting right now, and his, his client base right now is galleries. Right. So he's targeting what he's presenting. He's not just showing everything. He's showing exactly what he wants to show. Yeah. And you could label things differently and whatnot, but the problem is people will look at your work as a whole, and that's where they'll always factor that in, even though if you don't intend to do that. But... Uh, yeah, so I mean, it, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to kind of think of like where can people see the illustration work? You know, I have no it's idea. It's gone. It's gone forever, folks. It's in magazines. Oh, you know what? If you uh, type in, if you look up my interview in Communication Arts Magazine, you'll see a bunch of it there. Well, yeah, I mean, you got to have you pulled your, you got a Society of Illustrator Award with one of your pieces. Have you pulled that off your site? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I don't have any of my illustration stuff on the. Cool, cool. But, but that, that's an important. But it's, for it, us it's, to, it's, I'm glad it's we're chatting. My, it, yeah, this is something to think about, folks. Hold on. Oh, my dog's got something to say about all this. Is that all he's yeah. got? That's all he's got to say. Yeah. Well, it's right, uh, my yeah. If you look at the communication arts, uh, if you type, it's, it's Google search Raymond Bonilla and my full name and communication arts you'll see you actually see that piece and a bunch of other stuff dude i'm looking okay. at it right now this is crazy good yeah. but this is important i'm glad we're chatting about it because i want yeah. everyone in the chat to understand like this is something you can absolutely choose to do what where you want your career to go um, right. and ray is focusing very strongly on his gallery work that's important and if i wanted to pursue more illustration work, I could always do that, you know, by creating yeah. another side. It's not a big deal. It's all it's all still there. So it's not Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still have it saved and stuff. You know, there's probably people in this chat who like want to get into visual development and the, well that's the stuff you want to face forward. You want totally. to show visual development work. Um, so yeah, just think about that when you're building your career or when your career is at a point where you want to take it in a particular direction. You'll know where to um, Put your focus on what you want to present because that is as an artist that's all you can present is your work right right um, you know your resume doesn't mean too much um uh, you know if you're in visual development it's going to mean a little bit based on the the games you've worked for um or films you've worked on but yeah um yeah so i don't know i didn't i don't didn't mean to make it like awkward, Ray, as to why you don't have. No, stuff man, I thought it was good to chat about. I'm, I'm just uh, giving this, taking this opportunity to catch up on this painting. That's all. And uh, <laughs> try, try and finish it. No, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I talk about it often, and uh, it's hard to. I was just trying to think of like where can somebody can see it because it was a big decision for me to. Uh, to not include the illustration stuff on it, but I knew if I wanted to focus my portfolio and send a very cohesive statement out there to the world as to what type of artist I was, uh, I needed to folk. I wanted to focus the work in a very specific vein. Um, I uh, two years ago, no, last year. It was last year. I had my solo show, right? Yeah, last year. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So. Uh, we went out. Year. We had a great time. Yeah, it was amazing. Was super awesome. Amazing show. And Tyler came out, fell in came love with the painting out. that it, he hasn't. I did. I did. I haven't about. told Ray what it is yet. Um, he knows. I will sneakily purchase it at some point. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Fresh, um, you know, he, spam f in the chat if uh, you think Tyler's a dork. <laughs> uh, pay respects. <laughs> so here's another great question from Lazre. Uh, I, I think you were in the middle of a story, but I'm interrupting you. How That's would right. you guys differentiate illustration and painting? For example, is Tyler's painting right now more of an illustration? 
I think this is a really good question. Yeah, this is a this is a tough question because it is it does come down really to what particular clients want. Um, I don't really know if there's a difference. It's it's a very blurred line between the two. It's it I I think it's more so the vehicle by which it is shared, you know, or presented in. So like, for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, Tyler's Magic the Gathering artwork, right? You, it's a card. You, you did the artwork for, let's just say you had an artwork for a card. Uh, he, but he painted it on a, I don't know, on a panel, um, like oil on panel or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's an illustration if it's in my, and this is totally my opinion on it. So, uh, oh, okay. Know, so it's going to be wrong, but okay. Take it with, <laughs> which means it's right. Uh, <laughs> but, um, it's an illustration if it's used for the card, right? But let's say you hang it in a gallery and it's a painting, you know? So that's, uh, that's really the, yeah. it's just wherever it's presented in basically, you know? Yeah. I, I agree with that. I'll agree with that. That makes sense. Yeah. It is, um, Right. If it's if in the print in the print material of the of the illustration, yeah, it's an illustration. But then, yeah, if I brought it to a gallery, what what what's to stop it from being considered fine art? Nothing. You know, Frazetta's right. Frazetta's fantasy illustrations are in museums now. Yeah, that's Frank Frazetta, the King of Sting. Not not David. <laughs> the man who Frizzetta. would have been a baseball player. Not who? <laughs> <laughs> Carla Frazetta? No, not Carla Frazetta. <laughs> uh, here's another you're question. Talking about, you're talking about Carla Frazetta, right? <laughs> you, do, you, know, you guys know Carla. Um, Nick DeLuca96 asks, can you talk about gamut masks? I try to understand, but it seems very random. Am I missing something? Oh uh, yeah, you know when I first was looking at gamut maps. Yeah, Tyler just threw out like gamut maps, like you know. Yeah, like gamut maps. Like, gamut like, maps. You know, it's like saying Higgs boson. You know. Yeah, so there's a deeper connotation. <laughs> um, I thought it was. I, I agree with the. Um, it seemed random, right? Um, That's because it, it was it not. folks. No, I, no. I mean, it's. I guess there's a randomness in that you're picking the colors you want to work from, but there's. There's principles of, of color theory built into that. Um, you know, when, when someone like uh, James Gurney's doing it, he's picking essentially like complementary splits, right? I mean, would you would you would you say he's doing that, right? Um, yeah, yeah, totally. I, he's you're basically essentially masking off the uh, different sections of the uh, color wheel and saying, right. "I'm just going to use." these sets of colors they're just that's all it basically is it's just saying i'm pairing this off and it's just help it's just a way of helping you focus on like choosing a color because that's the, the main problem with color uh and i think tyler agrees with me on this is like you when you're first uh running into color and learning color the main one of the biggest problems is like having setting yourself up with too many choices of colors and like, cause there's so many variations you could use what it is, you know? So the question is like, what, what the hell do I use? But, um, so gamut masking helps you, uh, basically focus in on like, you know, narrow it down a little bit easier. Uh, and well, it, so it, it helps I'd you visualize helps you. also, uh, what, what the painting might look like too, you know? Yeah. And, but I'd say it also helps you, um, keep harmony. Um, right, you know, when you, right, you're right. using tons and tons of colors, it's easy to fall out of harmony. And, right. and trust me, this is something I've struggled with for years. Um, and I, I'm always learning. I have not figured it out. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. I've figured out something that works for me. Um, but I haven't, I don't think I've figured out um, the, I guess, entire philosophy of color theory. Um, I'm always learning interesting new things about it which I, you know, everyone should be always learning, I guess. But, um, uh, so, okay, let's get back in the rails here. Um, gamut masking or gamut mapping, right? Which are, I mean, which is the best way to 
say that. I always say gamut mapping. But you really are masking off a section of the color wheel. Yeah. So the, the, whole, the whole point of it is you are picking, let's say you're picking three colors. Um, I'm gonna hold my hand up here as a triangle. Like you're picking three colors. Um, those are the colors you can mix from. And you can't get anything outside of those colors. So wherever the far ends of the triangle are, are the basically the highest level of saturation you're gonna get on those colors. And oftentimes you'll see um, those triangles for gamut masking are, are drawn over the middle of the color wheel so that let's say you have, um, if I wish I had a color wheel up here, um, but let's say you have like a, a blue, uh, an orange and like a violet or something. Um, it, you're gonna run, a part of that triangle is gonna run across the gray part of the color wheel, the middle. And so that gray is actually gonna be your what, like greenish yellow. Um, and when you put that gray up next to everything, it's gonna look greenish yellow because it's color is entirely contextual. Um, I think that's a, a reasonable way to put it. Um, it. If I could illustrate it, it'd probably be easier to um, talk through it, but you're, yeah, you're essentially it's, it's limiting your language, palette. Folks. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. You, yeah, you're limiting your palette. Just a way of organizing your colors. There's a billion, you know, uh, color approaches, uh, but they're all centered on, predicated on uh, making it as uh, resistance-free as possible, or making the process of selecting the type of colors you want to use uh, as resistance-free as possible. Yeah, and if you're really strict with that layout, you get you you achieve color harmony. So there's nothing going crazy and. You know, I guess when it comes to color harmony, it is all about, you know, what you see as color is, is the light. Um, it's the light or the reflection of the light. So, you know, certain temperatures of light or certain colors of light don't allow certain colors to live or exist. So, you know, if you have a room lit with or hot orange light, blue cannot exist in there. It will just be gray. Um, so that that's the kind of the principle that's going into um, mapping your colors out um, with a gamma mask is you're, you're dictating what the temperatures are and what colors can exist and what colors can't. Bada bing, bada boom, answer. Done, we solved color theory, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> Play the outro music, Kate, we're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. I like that. <laughs> that's good. That is good. Um, that is really I'm good. glad. Let's you know, working. color is so complicated. We're going to have to dedicate whole episodes of this to it. Yeah, it's... Uh, it could be... It's also like... We've talked about this, Tyler. Like, it's also very over people worry about it more uh, too a little too much too i think right but yeah I get why because it's it's super intimidating but it really kind of uh masks the the real issue with most people's paintings which is more value based and draw you know under the realm of drawing you know and and value um or design and value uh and so like yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess if I was have to suggest someone out there trying to figure out color, worry about value first, and then temperature. Um, that's you what know, I was told in school by uh, Randy. Told me that um, it was excellent advice. Yeah, and like, uh, there's this really great artist. His name is Graydon Parrish. Um, he he's actually the Tyler, the guy who did the his push push the Munsell uh, kind of color theory thing. But oh, okay. remember, yeah, yeah. I remember talking to him about it, and he's like, "Always, just always think hue, value, chroma. Like if you're thinking about color, uh, and it's like, what what's the color of it? Uh, I mean, this is how he th thinks about it, but I think about it a little bit differently. But it was helpful. Uh, what what's the color? Let's say you want something red, right? Okay. 
Um, you want uh, so that's the hue. All right, value. You want a light red or a dark red? Uh, I want a light red. Okay, boom. Chroma. Is it going to be super saturated or, um, you know, uh, sort of dull? Uh, kind of dull. All right, great. You know, and so you you think about that also along with like color temperature in, in that map. And there's just like little ways. That's an example of like a way like artists have figured out a system. The thing is, regardless of the artists, you know, if they're pretty prolific, they they figured out their system. They all have like systems that help them make work um, efficiently and consistently. Uh, you know, co consistently. You know. Um, right. And I think that's something that we've. It's part of one of the reasons why we wanted to do this uh, this stream because it's just there's so many. I don't know uh, misconceptions uh, and mysticism behind all this stuff, and it's really. It, they really shouldn't be, you know, and um, and there's also uh, we wanted to point out and, and show like there are many ways to make a painting. You know. Yeah, I mean, all those different ways to approach it, like approaching color, approaching um, mark making, approaching how you paint, style you paint in, all of those things dictate your style um, and and what makes up your signature look or your mark making look or any of that stuff your style is dictated by a what we call it a confluence of all of those different um, philosophies and how you interpret those philosophies you know like someone like greg manches as if you guys know his work or look him up you know he approaches captain mark morgan making, yeah captain morgan he approaches mark making quite differently than a lot of people so that has become a, a really standout signature for him right And I think that's, at least that's how I'm picturing it in my head or how I've always seen it is, it's sort of how we figure out how to interpret all these concepts. That ends up becoming our, our style. All right, I got a question for you, Tyler. Do it. How do you figure out what type of mark making uh, to apply in your, in your pieces? Or how did you figure out your uh, method of, of approach to mark making right i don't think i did it consciously right i think um like i mentioned greg manches because when i was in school i was like constantly trying to do paintings like greg um and so you're trying to make paintings awesome i was trying to make them awesome um, because <laughs> i was like this i would see this stuff and i'd be like this is absolutely crazy super good like the the best stuff i've seen and i so i was like okay how am i going to do this and i think like in school, I did a number of paintings that were very, you know, I, I call his style kind of like uh, chunky, like it, um, just really deliberate, intentional brush strokes. Um, I did a bunch of paintings like that. And, and, but as I started, you know, working in, in illustration and, um, you know, it was 10 years ago now, over 10 years ago now. Yeah, 11, over 11, 2009. Yeah. Yeah, so I, as I did more and more paintings, this is something I encourage like young artists to do is the more stuff you do, the more you start to target in on your own mark making, what your mark making looks like. Um, because the more paintings you do, the more of a shorthand you develop um, for making a shape. Like let's say you're painting an ear, you know, it, if you can try and make it, if you can try and paint it as few strokes as possible, the, the more you get that that sort of handwriting down, the more that becomes your style, your particular style. It's your voice and how you create imagery. Um, so I think that's kind of how I landed on the, the way I paint now. Although I'd say the way I paint um, digitally is a little different from the way I paint in oils, uh, just because the, the mediums are different. But yeah, I don't even know if I did it consciously. I just kind of landed on it. And it's the way that I work. Yeah, I think I think you did it conscious. You indirectly did it, but you did it through the practice of emulation, right? Yeah, At, sure. We're all you know. none of us none of us become artists in a vacuum, right? We, we're all inspired by various artists through over time, except for me, except for Ray. 
In yeah. Inspired by but no you know, one, like inspiring you... no one. <laughs> <laughs> did not expect that to backfire the way it did. Yeah, yeah. See, quick, there's a lightning whip on the other end of this call. It's just in. We're looking for a new moderator, producer. Yeah. Good um, luck. Pay. Probably your <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Hey, so that's our, a, our, I'm, I'm glad we brought this up though because it's such a good thing yeah. to chat about you know I think a lot of people don't know where to go at, or they're like oh my stuff looks derivative or I just don't yeah. know how to get my own voice into my mark making abilities and it's honestly something that just takes time and repetition it's you can't choose to have a style I mean you can but you can't choose to have your own style you, you, it is a culmination of everything you've learned and all the people that inspired you um, it's not something that just happens out vacuum. God, I wish it did. I wish it did. And we, I remember Tyler and I would just stress out about this all the time, just hope, wishing that it was easier. And they're like, there's got to be an easier way. And maybe we're doing it wrong. And turns out it was just lots of painting and studying, <laughs> looking at artwork. And, you know, there's also, I think, looking at work is huge like i agree i agree with this it's you know why not uh lean, you got to lean on um the painters that came before you to get an idea of what's been done right because you're you just i mean you'd be foolish not to because you you'll just end up just repeating or coming to a conclusion that was probably uh you know, a turf that's been, you know, uh, discovered and before. And like, it's much better to have the knowledge of like artists from centuries over centuries than it is to just look at, also look at just one type of artist too, like varying up your, your influences. Like we talked about Greg Manchester, right? Classic example. We don't, we didn't just look at Greg Manchester. We also looked at the artists that influenced Greg Manchester himself, mm -hmm. right? And so that people like Mead Schaefer. Mead Schaefer, and, right? Um, there's a whole bunch of other artists out there that that I imagine Greg pulled his inspiration from. Yeah, brandy wine artists, and and this is something our, our teacher Bill Mon uh, set, uh, would would recommend to us. It's like just collect images of art that you like, and. Uh, collect as much of it as possible. And he had, like, he showed us a binder of landscape painters. It was a landscape painting class. I don't know if you remember this uh, this day, Tyler. Uh, where he showed us, like, a, um, it was just a binder. The day you were late? It's the day I was. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, go on. Maybe, no, go on. Tell your story. Maybe another. You had to bring that up. <laughs> that was one time. That Maybe one day we'll tell that story on, uh, on the stream. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and then maybe sell a, uh, t-shirts with uh it'll spill uh, but anyways yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I revealed too much uh so bill had showed us a, uh talked about influences and he showed us a binder of all these different landscape painters from he loved the california impressionists and so he said he started collecting any image that he had from magazines uh and you know because bill was old school so uh and he said just collect a bunch of stuff uh, and this is how you build kind of a visual library of things that are possible. So like you, for instance, take Greg Manchus, you might like the way he has, he does chunky brushstrokes in like the face or his head, but you might not like the way he does buildings. So you go to another painterly artist and see how they, you, you might like, I don't know, let's just say the way Dean Cornwall does buildings uh, versus Greg Manchus. And then but you don't like the way either of them do foliage. So then you look at another artist that does foliage, just to say, um, you know, Howard Pyle uh, or Harvey Dunn, you know, and there you start to build, you know, a library of what's, what's possible. Uh, and then you just experiment and paint a lot. And eventually it will unconsciously become your, your handwriting because you're essentially, it's who you are is there. It's already there. You're born with it, but you need, training and you need to the study to help it's almost like a large piece of marble and you need to sort of carve away you know the tools the training and and your influences to studying art carves away that gigantic piece of marble to reveal the you know the person that you were all along inside you know um i hope hopefully right. that wasn't wasn't too zen i don't know but, no but it makes sense right i mean you're 
it's like okay so you've made this visual library right let's say that's step one becoming a um an artist that has its own their own view and and look and style and then you see things that works like you said like maybe you want to use this particular artist's way of painting foliage then you try to do it now it's it's gone through two different lenses at that point it, it's it's their lens the artist that you liked and then now it's your lens and you're not going to be painting exactly like them because you're not them but you're going to figure right. out how to get close and then that's going to be slightly different and that's going to be your style right. it's it's this it's this awesome sort of collection of the ages you know it, it's like it's like that Alphonse Mucha to Richard Amsel to Drew Struson kind yeah. of evolution of image making. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you just uh, made me think of something. Uh, a way that many artists have done this is through copying favorite pieces of artwork of theirs. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a wonderful practice. Uh, I don't do it nearly as much as I should. Uh, probably should, but uh, I have done it and I've always learned a ton, you know, just uh, that's how I learned how to digitally paint. Uh, Tyler ran me through a bunch of uh, techniques in Photoshop. Uh, uh, they're digital equivalents to analog uh, techniques. And then uh, I just copied a bunch of paintings, oil paintings, uh, old illustrations that I really loved and tried to make digital master copies of them. And I was able to understand how to get a certain brush stroke, you know, because since you need to physically be able to physically apply it um, with, with art, there's a physical an application end of it. You have to understand or train your hand to move in the way to get the result that you want, because it's usually, I don't know, at least for me, it's never what you think. Uh, you look at a brush stroke, you look at a head, when you copy, you really realize like, oh, here's the course the artist could have taken to probably get here. And it's usually way different than what you had thought when you get started. Yeah, it's all, you always see something done, you're like, that seems pretty easy. And then you try and do it and it's like, oh, yeah. okay. All right, I gotta yeah. figure this out. I got a question. Yeah, um, yeah, go ahead. I had a question from the chat. Aaron Rafino says, Aaron. how do you balance experimenting with your style versus having to produce consistent work to be hired? Um, there's a there's a certain aspect to making great samples, question right yeah this is an awesome question because it, there's like a it, there Aaron and a, Nick with the great questions <laughs> you got to accept a certain level of I have to do samples here to build your portfolio out because it can be hard to experiment with a style on a job um, you know the art director came to you for a particular look that they saw in your portfolio. You don't want to surprise them um, with something they've never seen, right? Um, so I, I would, if I, if I were advising um, anybody to, if they're going to try and create a new style, do it outside of your regular work time, um, which of course is hard, You're trying to pay the bills, but um, you don't want to surprise any art director. So try and build that style separately, um, and slowly work it into the way you work. I agree. Um, you, there's a, yeah, you never really, you, I, you never want to surprise your art director with something completely different. But there's, there's no problem in shifting your style over time. I mean, that's fine. Everyone does it. I mean, you look at the like, you look at any of the work of all the artists we just mentioned, um, their work's pretty different 20 years ago or, you know, if they're yeah. long, long dead, um, hundreds of years ago. You remember Greg's, uh, like, old work? It's, yeah. It's like airbrush uh, stuff is super tight. It's way different. Super photorealistic. Um, oh, didn't we find, and Ray has all the, this large collection of old um, annuals. I'm a little nuts when it comes to finding, like, old artwork, and especially the illustrators, so. But we found, didn't we find some like Todd Lockwood stuff that was oh, vastly yeah. different from the way he works now? Yeah, it was like a like rhino it, with uh, I mean, air, airplane wings on it. <laughs> yes, it was awesome. Um, and <laughs> obviously there's styles and that's the game of illustration, right? There are particular styles that last and there are some that don't. Um, as 
as art directors have different tastes and come from different time periods, they want different looking stuff. Um, and that, that's something to just, you know, be ready for. Um, sometimes yeah. as an illustrator, you kind of got to shift your work with the style of the times. Right. Yeah, I think John Matos is a good example of that. Um, you know, you look at John Matos's work in the 80s when he was doing like airbrush for Indiana Jones and um, he did the Rocketeer poster and his work after that. I got went in, at that. Yeah, he went digital after that, right? So right. Um, his work is very different now. So that's that's just how it is. Your your, your style kind of shifts with with how things go, the times. Another question from Nick Deluca, yeah. ninety six, on hey, mark making. How do you guys tackle large flat areas? Those seem to be the hardest areas to make look interesting. Big old brush. I was going to say, well, a big <laughs> ass brush. Bigger the area, bigger the brush. Really, that's as simple as that. Like I, I've been yes. doing a lot of my magic cards uh, in oils now, and I've doing them on pretty big pieces, like eight times as big as this little canvas here. You can see the size of my hand on it. I, I just use bigger brushes for the bigger areas. Um, you know, that, that's that's all you really need to do. Now, I will say there is something to be said if you. It takes a while. It takes longer, but you know, the more you paint, the more you can you can mess around with this. This is something that Bill Nomon had, had told us one time. He's like, you know, you could paint a brush, you could paint an entire 30 by 40 painting with like a number two brush. It will have a different look to it. Um, but you've got to be careful um, with that, you know. Uh, and uh, so, and, uh, and Craig Nelson, another uh, one of my teachers would say like, if you're having problems with making, creating interest in it, uh, like a big area, first think about your composition. Like uh, if it's, you don't want to make sure, you want to make sure it's not too much of an un, un, like kind of useless dead space. And the second is try and nail the mark on the first go with the big, big brush. And so like, assume you're, uh, you know, Think you're right, go in with confidence as if you're right, but assume that you're wrong. So like give yourself the um, permission to go back and, and change it up. Uh, and John Resch, uh, one of my, uh, another teacher of mine's great artist, um, did the Wells Fargo logo, uh, would have me do small studies because uh, I'd have that same problem. And I would do small studies uh, of comps of all of my my large paintings and that's actually i started to do them again um and you know i can then take the large areas that look really cool that i messed you know i was able to put in really interestingly with like a number two brush um and blow them up <clears throat> and you know that will help sort of help you sort of navigate through that and then look at artists other artists and how they've done it because like it, it all depends on the artist you know but that, that approach is, is essentially you're working uh, big to small, which you, you right. want to do. You, like if you were doing a sculpture, you wouldn't just start working in on the, you know, the ear shape right. and all the little minutia of the ear shape. You would, you would create all the big chunky shapes and then start adding fidelity. And it's the totally. same for, for painting. Totally. And totally. You, you want to start big and then start focusing in. It, it's a great it's a great way to to approach painting and a great way to it's a, a great way to grow uh, with that and then from there once you know how to do that it, it just gives you a sense of understanding how to build an entire piece all together because you've got to be able to balance all different ends of your, your work uh, eventually and this is after years of painting you'll be able you can understand and see how where a painting is going uh, with less and less information as you keep painting more and more you you can visualize it uh, easier uh, and much more earlier in the painting process so like i remember we were talking to greg manches uh, one time and he says i could see the painting already before i put the paint strokes down and that's yeah. wild because usually i don't see it until everything's kind of laid in but as i painted more i can i, I understood what he was trying to, i was slowly but surely i was starting to be able to see the painting 
fully developed earlier and earlier and earlier. And so, um, you know, uh, because like, so then once that happens, then you can, you could do things like, I know there's artists like Morgan Weisling or a good friend of mine's uh, Robin Ely, you know, who don't start with the big brush, start with the small, super small brush, start in one corner and then finish the whole entire thing. Uh, yeah. You know, from that, but, and like almost like a, like a printer and like how the hell do you do that? And it's not as, it takes a lot of brain power or just a lot of management to do that. And, and it comes with a lot of experience. Uh, and, yeah. That, I think that's the know. best takeaway on this is the experience, right? Like yeah. Greg does that because Greg has figured out how to do it. Like he's done it enough that he sees it all in his head. But I, I mean, I imagine Ray would agree with this. Like we do recommend if you're starting out to do the big, big brush to small brush method Absolutely. so that you can start Absolutely. to see it. Eventually you will of course get that muscle memory that um, when you see painters that just paint directly from, from nothing like the, the guy you were just talking about um, who, who would just start in the corner and paint a whole painting, you know, yeah, Robin, yeah. That, yeah, that, that is, that takes a lot of time and a lot of practice. It's yeah, really hard yeah. to just jump into that right away. Cause you just can't see the whole painting. And also it helps you think about it as for, you know, you're also learning how to see, right? So you're, it's what I talked about um, last uh, last episode, where with the whole tree sun house thing, you know, where uh, it's you you're trying to break your a tendency to see things in symbols or patterns, uh, and, and instead of and learning how to see things for what they are, which is uh, you know uh, large shapes of light and dark, you know, and mm -hmm. um, that takes time. And so you have to, and the way to do that is you have to understand, you have to see the whole image and consider the whole image. And a way of doing that is always working in a way. Of, and this is not just something that Tyler and I made up. We, I wish we would have, we would have been millionaires by now. Um, <laughs> or jillionaires, right? Uh, is artists figured out, like, if I work large to small, I can organize my painting better and I can get to the finish and not work on a beat, uh, ha have my painting and work on a, an area of a painting that's important and not waste time um, repainting things because uh, I couldn't see the whole image uh, come together. Right. It's a matter of efficiency. Yeah. Um, you know, you, a lot of times in, in any field of art that, you know, efficiency is really important. You need to, you need to get the job done. Um, totally. So finding, finding ways to do that ends up becoming a huge aspect of how you approach a piece, how you build it out. Um, it becomes a method essentially. And, you know, you find out that method you figure it out by studying it and also experimenting and off to the side just you know just to bring back the Aaron's question you know, it's... well and I guess like you just said too it's it is um repetition there's um yeah I, I've told this to students so much mm -hmm. that like don't just sit on one or two pieces forever right. and work on that just that piece you know um it's it is all about repetition. The more and more you do, the better and better you get. So you always be trying to improve and fill out your portfolio. Never just sit on one or two pieces. Um, but the more work you do, the better you get. The more you focus in on your style, the, um, just keep going. That, that's the best, I guess, advice I can give when it comes to developing your own look and your own voice is keep going. You know what uh, Craig used to call that? What? Uh, used to call that um, brush mileage. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Brush mileage. That's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, he's he knows. He's the man. Yeah, Craig um, Nelson. Craig Nelson. But yeah, that's it. It's brush mileage. I got a couple more questions so for you guys. So don't get complacent. Keep pushing. Okay, go ahead. All right. One from Avidity. Question, Tyler, what curse did you take to be so handsome and so good at art? I didn't write that question, um, but you have yeah, an admirer like in the you. chat. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like it came from you, babe. 
It didn't. No, unless <laughs> unless thank you. I thank you. Um, unless I quantum beamed into someone else's Twitch account, wrote that question with excellent punctuation and capitalization, which doesn't sound like me at all. Um, I'm going to take this as a rhetorical <laughs> question because your ego be does Tyler's not mom. need that. Yeah, I'll, but that's true. It, it should, thanks, Tyler's mom. Uh, I just well, could you um could you read the question again though? I just want to hear it. <laughs> Uh, real question. One, uh, before I say that question, it is one of, one of your two regular Scots. Uh, it is Talp the Scots birthday. Um, Tyler, you know him as oh, the birthday. Scottish fudge pusher. Um, it is, it is. Oh my gosh. This guy yeah. makes some serious fudge. Everybody. Fantastic. I'm not going to make you any more fudge because you've won no, episode no. zero. You completely I, disavowed he, the, uh, the Scots. He knows I'm for Scottish independence. Okay. He let's knows. not let's not Anyways. get back into that. Lazre has a question. <laughs> Ray, do you work from pictures for your paintings? You seem to catch capture very fleeting moments. Uh, yes, great question. I do. I work from uh, sometimes multiple photographs, um, and That's I all work from his I, head. I edit. I, yeah, I wish, but I edit a lot of the colors and the feeling of light. Uh, in Photoshop. Now, the only reason why I'm able to do that and make it feel like it's a believable uh, moment uh, or natural, uh, which is what I'm going for, is because I've painted a lot from life. I've done a lot of landscape painting. I mean, not as much as like others, but I've done a lot of painting and drawing from life. So I understand how life falls uh, naturally, you know, the way from when I've seen it. Uh, and I'm able to capture the scene as closely as possible to what I remember because photos just they edit things they compress values and they do all these weird things yeah, uh, there's grain. Size text. yeah yeah but there's grain and like there's all these like weird weird things that if you don't understand why you know uh, what should be there uh, then uh, you you could be at the mercy of the your photo uh, reference and so um, yeah I, I, uh, I do do that there's a lot of these moments also like don't only last for, I mean, literally, you know, a minute, uh, if, if that sometimes or maybe five minutes, you know, because the lights yeah, change so much. You know, that's that so. golden, golden light, which is really yeah. hard to catch. But that, that leads to a really good thing to chat about, I think, is you know, there's no, there's nothing wrong with using photographs to paint oh. your stuff. I think there's that it kind of leads back into that thing you said about like, there's something magical about making art. It's like any artist we know that are really good at what they do, they have tons of reference. Um, there's no way to do it without it. Don't be ashamed to use reference. You know, I know this, I know some people who came from like the comic industry and you know, you're not allowed to use reference, it's really bad. But that because, attitude's because shifting. Jack Kirby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that that's kind of yeah, shifted yeah. now. It's not like you look at people like um, Alex, Alex Ross, Ross or yeah. Adam Hughes. They both use tons of reference. Um, that's that that game has changed, and that never be, never get sucked into that. I guess pure, purest way of thinking, and that like you can't, you got to use no reference. Everything's got to be from your head. Well, that's impossible. You know, you have to collect reference from the universe. Um, you have to store it in your head or store it in folders. Um, that's that's just how great art is made, especially especially if you're a figurative artist. You know, by figurative, I mean you're working in a somewhat realistic vein. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, yeah, and and remember, reference comes in many forms: reference from life, reference from photographs, reference from maybe sculpting something in 3D. Uh, I mean, studying nature is key. I mean, Tyler and I, how many freaking painting classes did we take when we were painting from life, man? Like Tons. It's so important. Um, take them wherever you can, oh. you know, or set it up the way, you know, you don't have to go to a class to do it. No. Set up something like it. Um, it's great to paint from life. You learn so much. Um, it's great even just, Paint from reference, or like Ray said, paint from other people's paintings. I wouldn't recommend putting much of that, if any of it, into your portfolio. No, especially no. Um, especially master copies. Don't put that in your portfolio. No, yeah, that's for your like own that. education. 
go to like a Caravaggio and put that in a copy and put it in your uh, portfolio and be like, oh my God, that's the end. Because somebody might not know, I'm like, oh my God, that's incredible. How'd you do that? It's like, oh no, no, it's just Caravaggio. Yeah. But you know, it's a sweet copy, right? You know, <laughs> you don't need to, you don't need to be like, hey, look how good I can copy someone else's paintings. That is for your own practice. And it's kind of like, you don't need to post your practice. Um, you can post your practice, social media and all that, but in your portfolio, your practice doesn't need to be in your portfolio. Yeah. Oh, cool. Here's another question. Okay. Rapid fire. It's awesome. Are there light effects that are harder to capture in paint than in photography mm. and vice versa? Wow. That is a um, great, great question. I'd say, yeah. Um, I, I mean, based on, uh, like, I mean, like we were mentioning earlier with the magical effects, that stuff can be pretty challenging with traditional mediums. Um, the, the like, like bloom of, or glare off of a light source, um, that's a really, really soft transition. So that can be pretty hard to um, paint. It ends up being a really subtle effect. Um, but that just takes time and practice, you know, back to our theme, time and practice. Yeah. Uh, usually things that are very light and very saturated. Right. Because as you lighten the color in, in oil paint, it tends to uh, become desaturated. So the chroma goes down. And so um, it's... It's very hard, especially like if you look out on screen, like the screen has a wider gamut of color uh, than, you know, uh, than you can achieve uh, on like a flat, like a surface, like a for oil painting, because with screens, they're producing their own light source, right? And the way you see color on oil paintings, this light is bouncing off of the uh, painting into the painting and then jumping back at you. And so, um, so yeah, just try try to mix a color from a screen. Good luck. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> it's it's you have to tweak, you have to tune to calibrate your screen. Um, but there's also some colors like you're just never going to be able to to mix. No, yeah, totally. totally. Just, totally. Well, just the, the, yeah, it's completely out of gamut. It will never print, and you'll just will never be able to mix it with a physical color. Right. And most importantly, it will never print. <laughs> Yeah, it will. We'll that's print. um. We'll never print. We should there do a whole episode another. just on that because I have. Yeah. I mean, I've dealt with magic and D and D for print for a long time, and it you nothing is more devastating than finally seeing your item in print and getting all excited about it and grabbing it and then seeing like, oh my god, it looks nothing like how it looked on my screen or how it looked on my canvas because you see my baby. Yeah. The gamut is a real thing, and there are many colors that will not print. So be careful that, um, you know, method, we can go deep dive into this at some point, but um, great methods for dealing with that are, um, there's CMYK um, shortcut in Photoshop that will show you what it will, it'll approximate what it will look like in CMYK. Um, and there's also one that will show you what will print out of gamut. Um, and it'll, it'll appear as gray on your canvas, on your image in, in Photoshop. So play around with those settings um, so that you can figure out where, what, what your stuff is going to look like in print. you got to show me that, Tyler. Oh, yeah. Well, it? it's, um, they're great settings. They're, they're uh, proof settings in Photoshop, and they let you preview what you're going to have. And... Oh. and um, the, I think the gamut one is really great because it grays out everything that's going to print outside of gamut. And then you can put an adjustment layer down and sort of move the sliders until those areas become not gray, become a color that is close. Then you can have a lot more control over what you're going to see in print. Sick. Awesome. Hey, Kate, how are we doing on time? Yeah. Got, got about 20 minutes left. Nice. Uh, so here's a question from Evacuate. Full circle. So when painting light effects, do you cancel colors from an area or palette because colored lights kill colors? Repeat that question one more time. 
When painting light effects, do you cancel colors from an area or palette because colored lights kill colors? We might, if this isn't making sense, we can ask for clarification. We need a phone a friend on I, this one. I, I think I understand what you're saying here. Like if you're making up a scene and you want the light to be a particular color, then yeah, you will, you want to track that mentally. Um, like if you know that the character is dressed in all, let's say it's Superman, you know, he's Superman is dressed in all blue, but he's standing in orange light. Well, then you will remember to cancel the blue on his outfit. The, the blue part of his outfit that's facing the light is going to be gray, um, but it'll look blue in that lighting condition. Um, but yeah, yeah, you have to remember to track that stuff. If you have good reference of it, then it'll be right there in front of you. Here's a question. I from, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Here's another question from Lazare. I liked I like direct painting quite a lot, but I have problems when loading the brush. Any advice from Tyler on how to dial on this? Um, by loading the brush, do you mean like getting uh, like enough paint on the brush, or maybe we can clarify that? What, what you mean by loading the brush? Don't worry. Yes, Lazare, please feel free to clarify. Ray, I don't even want to know your thoughts on this, so don't start. You... Well, well, I mean, I okay, I'll, I'll assume <laughs> I'll assume their their meaning on this, but um, I can see the issue with um getting enough paint out there. So I tend to, I mean, you can't see my palette, but I tend to use a palette knife like this, and I actually mix up little piles of the color I want to use, um, and then I have a little reservoir of that color. Um, so that, that's not hard. And I use a little bit of medium to get it to the right uh, viscosity that I want. So that that's a good method for getting paint on your brush. But yeah, you don't want a ton of paint on your brush because then you're going to have this, unless that's what you're going for, you're going to have this really goofy impasto effect. Um, yeah, use a palette knife. That's a, because usually it's because you don't have enough paint or you pick up too much. It's usually an extreme. And brush using a brush to generate uh, mix large amounts of mixtures is is difficult and cumbersome. And so at least I find, it, especially when you're starting out. So mixing with the palette knife helps uh, quite a bit. Um, yeah. So yeah. there you go. There was my opinion, whether you liked it or not, Kate. <laughs> I liked it. I mean, how dare you? But you know. Fresh F, F in the chat if you like my answer for the title. I don't think you understand what F in the chat means, Boomer. I, I do not. I do not. <laughs> oh, my God. Are we Boomers? No, we're not. Wait a sec. I'm an in internet Boomer, bro. We're Boomers, bro. Uh, I'm doing something. I'm control z in right now with my gloved finger. Don't do this with your ungloved finger. Um, uh, this is my control Z in oil painting, my finger. Looks great, Tyler. Are you going to sign that? I think so. I think I've reached um, a point where I'm going to just put it down. Um, no, I could probably is a lot faster than I am. Tyler wins get... again. I uh, know. Tyler wins well, again. No, but this isn't good or bad. Speed is not the thing, right? It's like. Oh, um, no, it is. It's everything. This... On this show? Well, oh, it is everything. But <laughs> it's, it's for this show. It is for this show. It is everything, everybody. Everyone listening, it is. It, it really is everything. But um, you know, different methods take different. You know, ready to hold underpainting in the first one. I didn't do an underpainting. You so guys can't hear it, but I there's... used a gong sound effect just then. Oh, nice! <laughs> it's because the only ones I have are gong and selfie right now. But you just wait till next. I love next it. Episode. You know what? I'll catch it in the vod, I guess. Yeah, but but just just take a moment and. And just be, take it in and just know that you were a part of a show where a, a gong sound was used. I know. Step back. I'll step back. Just I step back. I, I appreciate it. You just completely ruined, <laughs> ruined that. What was I saying? What were we talking about? Chat, plus uh, F in the chat if you want another gong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. This is the quality of content we're bringing to you folks out there in the yeah. world. Take it or leave it. 
please take it and tell your friends to take it as well. Yeah, and tell your friends. Tell your friends. <laughs> and tell them not to leave it. Tell them to come take it. But I'm gonna do I, I am gonna throw my signature on this because on the Ripley one, I kind of did it properly, so I need to re-sign that one. Um this is the 18th signature I've figured out over the years. And this one was born out of signing magic cards. At hold, hold on, hold on. Stop. Oh, no. Oh, God. What were you going to do? Well, I'm going to change the camera so they can actually see you sign it. It's too low right oh, now. Oh, do it. Okay, hold on, I'll hold stop. On. Hold on. All right. Now go for it. This oh, is, I have so like good. a flat, I've got a flat brush. And I'm pulling the. This is doesn't look good already. It already looks bad. Wow. Great. Yeah, you messed this up real bad. It's the worst part of a painting. Control Z. Honest. This is damn the damn signature. It's probably one of the easiest parts if you ask me. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'm signing it. I I used to sign my paintings, and Ray remembers this. Right, right when I got out of school, I used to sign them, Tyler Jacobson, my whole name. Um, and I don't. I just don't like writing out Jacobson. I'm, Jesus, I'm cool with my really? last name. I did like. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I like my last name, of course, but it's a lot of letters. Um, so now I'm just doing a Vincent Van Gogh thing, and I just sign my name Tyler. J. Tyler J. Because whatever, uh, I'll be dead eventually, and. And they're people are going to be collecting my paintings anyway. <laughs> oh, Jesus. God, that is what I just... I didn't even finish the sentence, and that's what I was about to sound like. No one will be collecting these paintings, but I, 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 at that point, I'll be dead, and I won't care what signature looks like. But this is the one I like the most, so I'm sticking with it. Um, I like this one. 20. can't believe it's the 20s now. Oh, you, you, yeah, I should find you know, I haven't done the year in a while. You got to do the whole year. I learned this early on. You can't just do 20 because somebody can, can add whatever numbers they want at the end of that. You got to do 2020. I got to do 2020? Yeah. You I didn't do plan for that space. Well, See, do it, do it right. up the side. <laughs> All right. Control Z, control Z. Chat. F in the chat if you want him to just wipe down the whole painting and start over because he sounded wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I could put a, a efficient amount of solvent on this. This is, this is not how F in the chat works. What is it? Oh, what's the, uh, what's, what's, what's F the, in the chat? There's that, and then what's the, like, uh, uh, like, yeah, Tyler, for real, you know, you need to restart that. No cap when they say that or when they say W. <laughs> Oh my god. You're just, uh, now you're just guys, making stuff I just up. Turned, I just no, turned 38. I don't know what's going on. When they say W, like they just say W. Nick um, Burke says it. All the Call of Duty guys. <laughs> this is Switch, folks. Is this from, is this from your 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 um your favorite? No, this streamer is Nick that's Merck's, no longer this on is, this program. This is Nick Merck's. Uh this is all right. People like Tim the Tapman and Nate Shot. And... Anyways, go ahead. What were you going to say? And press F in the I, chat I to, try to pay your respects to little... our boomer friend, Ray Bunia. <laughs> son, son of a boomer. A boomer boomer. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you to do some kind of like wow, wow, like camera thing. Like, uh, hit him with the gong. Wow, wow. Give me the, with the, the gong, Kate. Yeah, hit me with the gong. Oh. I've, 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 oh. I've officially jumped it, the shark. Uh, we did I've, hit the sweet spot, there. apparently, in the chat. Three gongs was just enough. We might have tipped, We might have jumped the shark with four. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like too much, to be honest. I know. It's kind of like uncouth of me to request a gong, too, when you think about it, right? Like, I don't pick the gong, the gong picks me. Yeah. It's, everyone knows that that's the case. Um, so I've signed this, um, and uh, Ray wants me to destroy it. So I'll do that later. 
Oh, now I can actually. I haven't even had a chance to see Rays though. All right, this is looking great, man. Yeah, it's getting there. It's. Getting I like there. that hot, really hot light you put on it. Yeah, I redesigned the uh, the colors in Photoshop. Way of uh, just uh, changing things up so it's a little bit different from from yours. I'm gonna actually move. Uh, I'm gonna do another glaze just so I can show that. Uh, and That's something I do with my reference too, though. Is that if I have reference of somebody, or if I've even generated the reference digitally, I will mess with it in Photoshop so that it, I can get like the right colors that I want. Um, whether that's like upping the saturation, or messing with the levels, or the curve, or just anything to push it into something that's a little farther from like the actual reference that I took. Yeah, so back in the day, artists used to do that by just doing color comps and changing up reference and doing small studies, basically. Uh, and you could do a lot of that visual. It's all, all it is is just visualization. That's what Tyler and I have been talking about since uh, episode zero, right? It's like visualize, mm -hmm. being able to do what you can to visualize and make, make this efficient. So you know, because it's not what to do. It's like, I'm sorry, it's not how to do it a lot of times for us. It's like, what the hell to do because it, there's so many options uh, and so what's appropriate what's not appropriate what looks good what looks like crap and a lot of times when you're first starting out most of the stuff that you do looks like garbage or your ideas suck too you know that's a lot of fun but uh, you have to weed through a lot of it so that you could develop your eye you know and uh, and Photoshop is one of the ways you can do that yeah, use all the tools uh, that are available to you. There's just yeah. so many things you can do. Um, I think we chatted one of these episodes about um, the people that use all kinds of digital tools to build all their reference. There's just totally, totally all the tools that are available to us here in this century. Um, man, just use. And them. also, and also, we you know, like when Tyler and I first started out, we had like. I mean, it's nice to think that we were doing the same type of work that we're doing right now, but I mean, I was the same quality, but Tyler, I mean, no, uh, we were both like really off. So like, yeah, yeah, but, you haven't grown but we didn't know it. We didn't know it. Right. So we were like, you know, sitting around like, oh man, you know, it'd be super cool. And then, you know, like blue in this whole corner, right, man. And like, dude, and then like a warm light here and then a green shirt. And it's like, yeah, bro, that's so awesome, man. It's going to be the sickest painting ever. And then we'd actually do it and it looked like shit, right? And like, what yeah. happened, bro? I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing because we didn't know what we were doing. And we yeah. didn't talk like that because it was we were in California. We were in California. <laughs> you're obligated to talk like that in California. So. Right. <laughs> Anyone in the chat is from California. We know that's how you talk, okay? <laughs> At least around between uh, 2005 and 2009. <laughs> yes. No, don't, I, I actually blocked this from being viewed in California, so there's no Californians. Oh, good. Whew. That's good. A lot of artists down there. I don't want to piss off. <laughs> I have no problem with California. So, California, if you want to sponsor me and not Tyler. Hey, so, I am from California. Press that. Press F, I can make press fun F of them. Chat. Press F to ban Tyler. This is this is another place. <laughs> Saucefire. We're checking off another place where Tyler's forbidden to travel to. <laughs> yeah, the travel back ban is my, widened. Back to my home state. I can't go back. That's what happened to Muka. <laughs> Couldn't go That's back. What to happened check. to you? Yeah, well, that would have been what get... Czechoslovakia back then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Malumbo well, in the chat says that you're welcome in Germany. So there's one for you. You know what? I'm coming. I am coming there. Be careful what you I've wish to, for, Germany. Yeah, I've been in Germany a couple of times. It's awesome. Be careful what Great you place. wish for. That's oh, an awesome place. Shout out to Castle, yeah. Germany. But yeah, be really careful because you don't want us visiting. You want me visiting? Don't rope me into this, Tyler. <laughs> Look, I'm not even allowed in Scotland anymore. Right. So why would I want to ally myself? I've never even been. There? Never Kate and I are going, going to Scotland, lot. baby. We're going to Scotland, and you can stand right outside of, of what was it, Hadrian's Wall. You just stand right there and wait for us. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to hang out in England. We'll see. We'll see if I can bring over the paintings over to the border, dude. Check this out. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I got. I took this out of a castle. I got about five minutes before the alarm goes off. I gotta go. Uh, 
Well, one day I'll get back into the Scottish graces, but I'll take it slow. They'll bring me back. Well, well, well I don't think that's up to you, right? No, but um, it's, it's it's up, up to, to my ki my I'm my kin my, foot, my kin. <laughs> Oh, so man. I so, am I so you're done. I am not done. I will I'm gonna keep working on it and finish this off camera, which sucks. How much more say, time I, do you think you know you'll, it'll take you, Ray? I don't know. It's gonna take me I don't know. How much time I got, Kate? You you could keep going for another five or six minutes. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, it'll take me a little bit longer than that. I probably, I'm not gonna, yeah, uh, like I did with my Decker painting. I'll, I'll be sure to take photos of it and everything like that once it's done. Um, yeah. And you know, we're doing time lapses now. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed that. If you follow us on Instagram, live.brush, please do. It is awesome, especially the stories. Who man, quality artwork. Uh, <laughs> Coming at you, twenty four seven, baby. Ray, Ray uh, runs the stories, as you may have just picked up on. <laughs> I, I was gonna keep it anonymous, but I guess uh, the cat's out of the bag. So yeah, yeah, nice try. So you know it's gonna be awesome. Um, but that we like. Um, I think our whole what we want to do on that Instagram is like basically just you know, in the stories anyways, it's just show as much of the cool art. It kind of reinforces our idea of look at all the coolest art you can find, all the best totally. people in the industry. Yeah. Um, and we just yeah. want to do that. Um, the more you look at the better. And even by us just throwing them up there or Ray throwing them up there, you'll see that. Um, you know, hey, we're, you've thrown a couple of ourselves. things up there though. Yeah. We're, we're all looking at tons yeah. of stuff all the time. Different types of stuff, which is super important, you know, don't just yeah, I like to... to get a little perspective by looking at other things and figuring out how that might be applied to illustration. Yeah, like, uh, you know, comic work, uh, visual development, more stylized uh, character animation, uh, gallery painting, you know, just because you're a fantasy, if you do, if you like fantasy art, don't limit yourself to just fantasy art, you know, uh, and if you're representational artists and you just want to do galleries do not limit yourself to just those type that type of artwork because you just you're unnecessarily blocking yourself off from just an incredible breadth of just work uh that you could use to just grow um, mm -hmm. and so well, it's I, all it's also informative and it, it kind of like fires all those parts of your brain that think creatively Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Tyler and I, when we first, part of the genesis of this show was really us hang. I know we've probably mentioned this before. We used to hang out after school, after we graduated and we, we were on different ends of the country. We would uh, just hang out on Skype while we worked in the studio just to kind of recreate our working environment in um, grad school. And so we would send each other awesome artwork all the time. You know, I'm like, Dude, did you check this out? You know, we still had our, some of our California accent uh, <laughs> left over. You know? I think, like, oh, I think no. dude, when we were doing that, I feel like we would waste half of our work day going down <laughs> rabbit holes. Yeah. It was yeah. so often. Or really, like one of us would have an art book and we'd like go grab it and like bring it over to the Skype and like, oh, look at this art book. And it was just I swear to God, we wasted a lot of time, but it was not a lot. It was not a waste because it was research, essentially. Um, I was trying to say, built this show, and you just had yeah, a waste yeah. of time. I mean, not a waste. You know what I mean? No, F, F in the chat. If you don't know what Tyler means, the chat <laughs> is hungry for emotes, so we got to get on that affiliate status, boys. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah we, we got. We are trying. Okay. We are trying to do that. That is our next goal. And actually, to uh, to that uh, on that note, our next stream because we're probably wrapping up, right, Kate? Yes, sir. Yeah, four uh, minutes. It's four minutes. Yeah. So we are uh, next. Our next stream is actually going to be uh, not next Friday, but uh, that Sunday um, at the same time, uh, three p.m. Pacific Standard Time and uh, six p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
Um, so join us there. Uh, and we're going to be occasionally doing different days. Um, so, uh, so we can get affiliate status. Um, yeah. It's all part of our master plan. Get affiliate status. We might in, I think that's within our 30 day thing. So I think in mid September, we might do a, a, a weekend where we stream each day as well, but we'll keep everyone posted as to what we want yeah. to do there. It'd be like um, working on an extra complicated piece or something like that, or I don't know. Yeah, or, or we could also, if it's just the weekend, you know, maybe we're only doing like a couple one-hour streams or something. Or we totally. could do drawings, like we could we, we could oh, practice yeah. some drawing people. We do we do that too, folks. Forgot about that. We draw. Yeah, we could try out yeah. different illustration I techniques. Do. And, uh, uh, Malumbo in the chat suggests if you draw cats, then you'll have no problem. You'll get you'll get subscribers like crazy. <laughs> well, you know, I always say draw what you want to have in your portfolio. So um, you don't have very many cats. <laughs> I don't have a lot of cats. And Twitch is a is the home of the cat drawing. So uh, and yeah, we want to get that. How bad do we want to get that affiliate status? Oh, you so know? bad, so yeah. bad. Yeah. Okay. All well, right. uh, yeah, go ahead, Tyler. You can wrap, well, wrap it up. I think we'll answer. wrap by saying, I mean, we're going to, Ray's going to wrap his painting up off, off the air. And we are going to paint villains next week, right? Yeah. Um, when we reconvene on, um, you just said the time, Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tarkin? when we reconvene on, uh, Grandma we Tarkin? do our stream on a Sunday. Yeah, we're going to do Grand Moff Tarkin. So now yes. we got to find some good shots of Grand Moff Tarkin. That'll be pretty easy, I think. I hope so. That might suck. Uh, we, but, you know, we, won't we won't use see. anything from Rogue One. We'll use it from Star Wars New Hope. And yeah, I think that's us for signing off. Thanks for joining yeah. us, everybody. Thanks, Kate, for moderating. As usual, you're amazing. You're the best, Kate. Better than Tyler. Hold on. I accidentally hit the... Hold on. I said I said goodbye too fast. Here they're back, everybody. Oh, no. Sorry about that. Okay. We're back. <laughs> I, clicked, All right. I clicked the button really <laughs> very excited to just right. end how, this. Stream. How much of it did they catch? Did they miss did they miss no, the no, secret? No. It's just it was like half a second. Illustrated? I I clicked it as soon okay. as you said thanks, Kate. And I that was it. That was just like, no, you're not welcome. <laughs> oh, okay. So if you'd like to follow my work on Instagram, I'm under Ray Bonilla Painter. And where are you at, Tyler? Yeah, I am at Tyler Jacobson Art on Instagram. But if you uh, want to follow this show on Instagram and see the awesome artwork, uh, many wish, uh, many examples of the awesome artwork that we've talked about, follow us at live.brush on Instagram. And, Indeed. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Tyler. Great painting, dude. Thanks, Ray. Good thank you, you Kate. Again. Great yeah, painting, guys. And thank you for joining us, everyone. Bye bye. bye. I think, you're, I think you're clear. Maybe. Cool. Okay. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see if they can still hear you. <laughs> I, wish we had a I wish we had a theme song. <laughs> I think oh, it man, should be. Oh, man, me too. It's, oh, it's not clear yet. Nope. Hot mics. Hot mics. Hot mics. Oh, hot, hot mics. mics. Hot mics. Um, all right. They totally just. Don't get here. Oh, maybe you can hear.